Accessing the feed now. We're in. And hello, and welcome to, I guess, episode 1B of my XCOM 2 War of the Chosen Season 4 series. Um, this is where I'm going to go through people's bios. That's basically all this episode is going to be. I have my water ready because I'll probably need it after reading pages and pages of biographies. Jesus Christ, you people are probably wordy. So... Without further ado, let's start at the top. Cyrus Lancer Snow. Alright. Country of origin. Non applicable. Suspected United States. Cyrus Snow hadn't paid much mind to war of the worlds that occurred during the invasion. He didn't really care about the powers at large and his youthful. Uh, Naivety, I guess, and selfishness. As long as they let him do what he wanted, he didn't really care who was in charge of the planet. Fast forward years later, Cyrus now fully understood what happened when the rulers of the world changed. Advent was fully operational. This fully operational battle station. And his, <laughs> and his personal freedom was infringed upon with curfews, strict laws, and constant Advent checkpoints. His personal world was endangered, I guess this is what it's supposed to be. The agency he loved was on the edge of oblivion. Out of personal hatred for being so blind to the truth, Cyrus joined the resistance to participate in the ongoing guerrilla war against the Coalition and the forces of the Elders. As part of the resistance, he took on the codename Lancer. While he's brilliant and quick, his luck is abysmal. Oh, great. <laughs> Hopefully not. If it wasn't for bad luck, he wouldn't have any at all. How do you think he got that scar on his face? He was at the wrong place at the wrong time when Advent raided a resistance camp. I don't actually see a scar on his face, but unless it's the thing on his chin. He managed to pull other people into the fight, namely a neat who had lost her Fortress of Solitude. When asked why he had gone out of his way to convince her to join the battle, he simply answered, I saw myself in her. I shut in that needed to see the sun. We all deserve to see it at least once. All right. Next is Eunice Bulldog Harris. Commander, the following excerpts selected from this candidate's permanent records were somehow survived the invasion. But the following are excerpts selected from this candidate's permanent record were somehow survived the invasion. Oh, it's, we got someone who's old. January 21st, 1978, reported Dr. Michael Ele Olivetti, OBGYN, arrived for emergency C section at 12:37 a.m. Patient presented in the eighth month of pregnancy with severe head and neck injuries from an automobile accident. She was triaged as expectant and was to attempt to save the baby. And at triage as expectant and I was and I attempted to save the baby. The mother Cotted? I assume that means died. Shortly after my arrival and could not be resuscitated. The baby female was delivered successfully, but my prognosis for her is extremely guarded. If she can survive the next seven days, I would say her odds are 50-50 for the next few months at best. 3986. <laughs> Dear Mr. President, My name is Eunice. I'm... Oh, okay. So this is intentionally meant to be like a child writing because she's like eight years old. Got it. Dear Mr. President. So you're writing Ronald Reagan. Okay. My name is Eunice. I'm writing you to to you cause our teacher, Miss Yates, is making us. I thought, I think you are too busy to read my letter, but teacher says you read all your letters. If you read this, please pet your dog for me. My dogs love that. God bless you, sir. 12295. Freeport Journal Standard would like to praise Girl Scout Ambassador and Freeport High, S High Senior Eunice H. Harris for receiving the Girl Scout Gold Award, their highest honor. Miss Harris 
started the funding campaign responsible for revitalizing Freeport High School after Freeport High School after school athletics programs. Miss Harris thanked her grandmother, Maya Freeman, for the idea. Eunice is scheduled to leave for Marine Corps basic training next summer upon graduation. 6704, the findings of the special court martial law uh -oh, convened to adjudicate the relevant charges brought against Staff Sergeant E.H. Harris for the following viol violations are as follows. Article 90, assaulting or disobeying a superior officer. We find Staff Sergeant Harris not guilty. Oh, okay. That she was acting within the bounds of her authority when using physical force to restrain Colonel Richardson and his men. Failure to do so would have been dereliction of duty. Article 134. Conduct unbecoming a, a non-commissioned officer. We find Staff Sergeant Harris not guilty and can only hope that her continued service will inspire our Marines to meet her exceptionally high standards. Charges 3-7, through seven, Article 128, Assault. We find Staff Sergeant Harris not guilty on counts 4-7, through seven, but guilty on count 3. While we recognize the racial epithet used by Colonel Richardson was particularly foul, that does not authorize the use of excessive force against him while he was handcuffed. We will judge him. We, we will judge him, Staff Sergeant Harris, not you. We are sending you, you to the loss of one day's pay and to one day detention, which we consider you have already served. Return to duty, Staff Sergeant. 6-7-15. Divcom dispatch re Hello Flight 17-TN. Given a sudden loss of transponder signal and the combat losses reported in the AO of the crash, Sergeant Major Harris and her team are likely killed in action. SAR ops have ceased due to casualties they've taken in the last 12 hours. Divin is giving the team 50-50 odds. Sorry for the bad news. 6 10, 15. Sergeant Major Harris and squad reporting for duty, sir. Where do you need us? We're itching to fight. Oorah! Alright, cool. That, that, that was a pretty cool, uh, that was a pretty cool biography, I have to say. A Rufus Googly Galavir, XCOM personnel dossier, name, Rufus Galavir, to get a birth, October 31st, 2016, country of origin, Colorado, United States, known information, born in Denver, Colorado, Rufus is the son of former XCOM engineer during the initial invasion, they moved over top of an old XCOM bunker built in the mountainside, deep in the Rocky Mountains. There's already a small town there which Rufus, his twin sister Sa Sasha, and his older brother would grow up in. He would grow up learning all about machinery and different types of tech. Rufus's first achievement was making the town's water supply work again. Congrats. And he spent a lot of, a lot of his time with his sister, although she was much more focused on learning how to fight. Rufus still learned how to shoot, but he did not do it very often. He often learned how to play the bass, as his parents took a lot of their records and music with them. At some point in 2034, his team was attacked by Advent. His mother, father, brother, and brother were all killed in the attack, but Rufus and Sasha survived by hiding in the bunker under their home. Finding his father's corpse with a USB stick clutched in his hand, that held information about XCOM, Rufus began to seek them out, training at various resistance havens along the way. Rufus eventually found XCOM in the Avenger and sought to enlist in whatever way he could. Central's Notes I remember Rufus's father. He was a fine man. It's a shame that we lost him. However, Rufus seems to be more than willing to take up the fight, and I see no reason not to allow him to do that. Maybe we'll be able to find some closure for him and his sister. Also, don't ask me why, but rabbits seem to make the kid nervous. All right. Wow. I mean, you obviously found your way here. You made yourself on the gate crasher. Enjoy your time in, well, I would say the infirmary, but we don't have it yet. Olivia College King. Olivia is known as the party girl in college as well. And is and was well known by both the faculty and her dorm. If he needed something or someone snuck in or out of campus, she knew the quickest back routes to do it. Her motto was simply that life was too short not to party. It was not long before she realized just how short life could be. Maybe once this is all over, we should take this ship and go colonize one of their planets. 
Yeah, shut up, Central. Advent started coming around our college and people started to go missing. Professors, faculty, even students were being abducted or being sent to a gene therapy clinic. Olivia and other students started to use their knowledge of the campus to help others, but were soon caught. Olivia was the only one to make it out alive, having run into the wilderness of the Lost Zones. The Reapers picked her up and taught her their ways, but they couldn't break her of one thing, her desire to party. She's loud and obnoxious, perfect for a Reaper, of course. But when she goes silent, dot, 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 dot. All right. Caliber Thompson. Name, Matthew Thompson, age 47. Hey, we have some old, 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 old dudes on the roster. Not that I'm complaining. Call sign Caliber, date of birth, April 19th, 1988. Report documented by John Central Bradford. Matthew Thompson was born to a military family. He was raised to follow in the footsteps of the United States Army like three generations before him. At 18, he entered basic and enlisted in the Army. Seeing his valor and dedication to his duty, he was selected to be in the Army Rangers. After rigorous training, he earned his keep and became one. Of course, things went up and s things went up with uh, with the alien invasion in 2015. He and his unit were tasked to stop the alien forces nesting near the western U.S. borders. It didn't come to it didn't come to pass. His unit was massacred and he was the only survivor. After the aliens took over, he spent years living as a mercenary for the resistance, earning his keep selling supplies to get by. He never stayed in one place and preferred to be alone. He got himself in a fateful meeting with Amelia Wolf, a former soldier of the Bundeswehr, aka German Arms Forces. I am sure I butchered that. Seeing marksman skills a promising, she invited him to join Eagle Wing. From my understanding, Eagle Wing is a PMC that reformed itself after the invasion. I'm not sure what a PMC is, but okay. Rumor has it that they used to call it Scorpion and were involved in a number of war crimes, assassinations, and blood money during old world conflicts. Well, perfect. Despite its dark past, Eagle Wing has shown a dedication to the resistance in any way they could. While Thompson serves under the command of Eagle Wing leader Colonel Campbell, he would serve in the Recon Division while Amelia serves in the Operations Division. This led, a friendly, led to a friendly rival, rivalry between Matthew and Amelia. All things considered, Commander, despite some wariness over hiring a PMC contracto, Matthew is willing to join XCOM. He believes it is his duty to free humanity from the clutches of the Elders. After all, we're not above recruiting dubious characters to our cause. True! I said Matthew's loneliness could be a symptom of PTSD after losing his ranger unit. If possible, have him scheduled with a counselor on a bi-weekly basis, and it would be appreciated if we can help him be more team-oriented with his fellow comrades. Well, you're the one who is potentially bonded with Miriam, right? Which is cool because she's also pretty much a loner. Name, Miriam Rossi, date of birth, September 31st, 2015. Place of birth, Valletta, Malta. Miriam was born only a few months after the ceasefire between Earth and the Elders was signed. However, her home country of Malta saw heavy action during the war, being a major base of operation for European forces. As a result, Malta was a high-priority location for the Elders, with Advent turning the entirety of Malta's largest island into a city center. Miriam's pa parents were one of the few who declined to live in the city center, and thus were relegated to the slums on Malta's second largest island of Gozo. Here, Miriam could find many relics of the war, given the heavy fighting in the area. She see soon found an interest in tinkering with many of the human and alien wrecks found throughout the island. To begin with, Miriam was ambivalent about the alien occupation. However, after years of studying the wrecked alien text, she began to question why they were even on Earth. Their te technology was so advanced, what th could they possibly have to gain by being here? These questions eventually led her to finding some Sicilian resistance traffic over a makeshift comms device. Using scavenged alien text, she was able to decode the resistance messages, and what she heard drove her to try to join the resistance. Soon, she had found herself on a boat 
on the way to join the Sicilian resistance group. All right, now we get to our rookies. So the two rookies I sent on the covert action, I don't think I can read the bios of, but uh, so I'll do those to them when I come back. Hopefully I remember. Uh, so this is Victoria Baby Ryan. Born California, USA, date of birth October 13th, 2016. <laughs> spoiled brat bitch. Victoria was a spoiled brat, captain of the cheerleading team and all around bitch with the students of her school. She knew she was hot and she knew people would do what she said because of that or that she was rich. But did money even matter with the way the world was? Some would say no, and there was were more value there was more value in treating food, clothing, and medical supplies. But those people didn't live in the city. Those people had been trying to survive on the outside for a long time. That wasn't how Victoria's life was, though. She had a good life, outside of having to hear the rhetoric of the elder, elders or seeing advent guards walking about her school or neighborhood. It was like the war never happened and she was queen of the school. She had no idea about those that lived outside the city, and it would have stayed that way if not for the fateful day the resistance was targeted in her city. She'd been sitting in class when the explosion rocked the school. The resistance had been attacked by Advent next to the school, blowing up a wall. Matt, being at schools is apparently very dangerous in Advent world. Students screamed and ran for cover, but Victoria had been curious, and she went to the window. There she saw something that would change her life forever. A man was pulling a woman away from the bu burning building. Bullets sprayed around them and the woman was hit in the leg. The man noticed the teenager and yelled at her, Please help me take her inside. She's my wife. Why should I? Vicky spat back. But then she saw this was real. Someone was injured and she could help. Vicky had been trained in first aid since being on the cheer squad. So it was more for twisted ankles and heat exhaustion, not bullet wounds. So she helped the man pull the woman inside. She quickly realized she was over in over her head, but did what she could, and even managed to stop the bleeding using a rag, a belt, and some plastic wrap. But just as she helped save the woman, an Avon officer walked into the room and shot both the man and the woman in the head. He almost shot Vicky, but paused and spoke to her. Are there any more resistance in here? She froze and realized what was going on. These resistance that he had called them were just people that were trying to survive. Advent killed them. She later learned that more than 30 people were killed that day and that it was a supply camp for the resistance. It was after this that Vicky found out that the resistance was a thing. This was no longer about high school. She found ways to assist them from the inside by giving supplies to them. She took up skills at the gun range and learned to shoot. She wanted to find a way to stop Advent. This is when she heard about XCOM. Though now in XCOM, she still has some of her more childish attitude and that has earned her the name Baby. But she hates that name and is quick to remind someone of that fact quickly. Of course, they still call her that. All right. Time for another water sip. Alex Monarch Frost. Okay, this doesn't look too too long. Turns out, sectoids don't much like it when you brandish a knife near them. If you think I got the worst of it, you should see that ugly sod. Raised by, as many a fine collector in the UK has claimed, the greatest antiquities dealers in the world, Alex has lived a rather comfortable life. His parents raised him from old English legends to, in their words, keep the history alive. Personally, I always found it funny, considering their line of work, something they told him to never talk about to anyone. These old tales did, however, leave an impression on the young boy. By 16, he started seeing the New World and its current rulers for what they were, tyrants. He never openly shared his thoughts, knowing better than to cross those in power, but he did his part to play both sides. His family profited from some less than above board ventures, so when he turned 18, he asked to take along on one. Exactly At one time, I was in 
He ate Avon burgers. That's what he did. Mainly researching vaccine production techniques. Because of my background, I was rounded up by Adgen and put to work in one of the very first gene therapy clinics. I saw firsthand what their technology is capable of. For better, always. I'd say we're lucky to have you with us. I appreciate the sentiment. The trip sparked what would be a run of Advent cells. A run of resistance cells, God. <laughs> Each adopting the name of a group his parents had once belonged to. The Crown's Guard. Catchy name, at least he thought so. Okay, I was just rereading that to make sure I read it right. It's it's died a few times now. I've been hunted from the UK to the US. Okay, so the resistance group. But its members have been trained and tested. Now Z has expressed they are at your disposal. Alright. Violetta Gentleman Todorova. Country of origin, Bulgaria. Date of birth, April 7th, 2012. Formerly an Advent sympathizing citizen, a smug confidence carried a smug confidence carried Violetta through most every hurdle of her everyday life. A stylish dip of her hat, a certain confident walk, a warm smile, and doors open. Walking on the moon while everybody else was down below. Every day rules and restrictions were strained a precious bit more. Getting into areas she wasn't meant to be, hearing things she wasn't meant to hear. Seeing things that weren't w meant to be seen, or wasn't meant to see. Confident in her own ability to work her way out of every conceivable spot of trouble, Violetta inevitably pushed too far. Of course, being hunted by Advent did nothing to stop her in subordinate confidence when she was forced to abandon her life. The young woman radiated the same energy among the resistance and went, heard, and saw. And the state of life outside the city centers was below and beyond what she had expected. Still, even if life suddenly had new stakes, there was just no excuse to stop being a gentleman. How bad could a simple wink be, even if it was behind a rifle, a rifle scope? Nice. Rachel Knight Candace. Now, I'm interested in you while you're dressed up in Reaper gear, if, if you explain it. Date of birth, July 13th, 2015. Born shortly after the invasion succeeded, Rachel lived in a much more peculiar life. Rachel lived a much more peculiar peculiar life than those before. Being born into the XPMC known as Obsidian, another PMC, Obsidian Corps, much of her upbringing had been training, turned her, uh, turning her into a highly disciplined and honor-bound soldier. While Obsidian Corps itself had become a series of resistance cells. In 2033, though, the cell she lived with was discovered and attacked, and the survivors are scattered or arrested, Rachel being one of the latter. Arrested, okay. She was broken out of Advent custody only recently, but her strict by the book nature and personal code of honor remain, even if she's a bit more rusty than when she was thrown in prison. She since pledged her allegiance to XCOM and hopes that her surviving seals will come in handy. Note, creator. Oh, created by Prisco Pond, and okay, and on behalf of Tetra Wolf. Robin goes to Holmes. Born in Vancouver, Canada in the year 2000, as the child of two musicians, Robin Ghost Holmes was generally very quiet, still is. Even, his, even in his great big old combat boots, the man seems to sneak around with ease. It would be spooky if he weren't firmly on the side of XCOM. His relationships with uh, with his parents are interesting. His father went in for the resistance, ending up joining XCOM, but not before Robin's mother got arrested by Advent. She was arrested as a radical dissident for writing protest songs, of all things. Ghost hasn't heard head or tail of him for a few years. Okay. As for her, as for his skills. Well, it seems he's either incredibly good or incredibly lucky. So we have someone really unlucky and someone potentially in really lucky. All right. As he apparently managed to ambush an Advent Patrol near one of our routine missions. Problem was, he didn't really seem to have a plan after stick screwdriver and first trooper's neck and hope for the best. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> nice. 
If we hadn't found him, he'd probably be very dead by now. Commander's eyes only. Sorry, everyone. You have to turn off the episode now. Due to his glasses, this one would make poor, a poor sharpshooter. Though his hyperfixation on close combat weapons should serve us well. He seems overly eager to assist any way he can and seems fascinated by the idea of becoming more than he is. Richard Tynan. All right. Adam Weasel Williams. Country of origin, New Zealand. Date of birth, October 5th, 2008. If Advent has a mode wa most wanted list, then probably everyone in XCOM is on it. Adam has almost certainly won himself a spot on it. Not simply because of his skills as a resistant operative, but because of just how much he has humiliated Advent over the years with how effectively he has evaded their clutches. He's almost uncatchable. For over half a decade, Advent has made many attempts to capture or kill Advent. And virtually all of them have been complete and total failures. Search parties would be unable to locate him or find themselves slaughtered if they did. Well-planned traps would fail to stop him from slipping away. And on the rare occasion he was captured, whatever prison he was held in would find itself suspiciously atomless not long after. Adam is proud of how badly a global regime has failed to stop one man to the point of intentionally putting himself into danger purely to further humiliate them. So, he's going to guarantee get captured on some mission now, right? Stories circulate the local resistance of Adam intentionally giving his location away to kill squads to give them a sporting chance, entering city centers solely to provoke a public response, or even surrendering himself to Avon only to break out of prison shortly after. It seems like that's going to backfire eventually. The more public the stunt, the greater the risk, the more Adam achieves his goals of discrediting Advent. Perhaps understandably, Adam's stellar track record of not dying has gone to his head a little. You think? It's complete and total confidence that he is one of the best the Resistance has to offer. And he's not completely wrong on that front. He's a phenomenal fighter, skilled with both guns and melee combat, and his antics mean he's quite capable at ambushes. XCOM's specialty. He's got all the skills he needs to be a good operative for XCOM. To the Resistance, he's a walking middle finger to Admin. To XCOM, he could be a very valuable asset in a fight against the Elders. Though if he's recruited, it may be wise to make him tone down his reckless behavior. XCOM doesn't want their operatives intentionally handing themselves over to Admin, even if it makes for a good story to tell at the bar. <laughs> uh. So I take it that's why you're nicknamed Weasel, because you weasel out of things? Trophoran Trojan Armor. Date of birth, not applicable. Nationality, none. Trophoran, codenamed Trojan, was a suit of armor developed by XCOM during the initial invasion and was to be its answer to space warfare designed to provide an airtight seal, internal oxygen supplies, and purifiers capable of generation generating breathable air from even the most caustic environments. It was also designed to enable a soldier to keep fighting even should they suffer an injury that would otherwise cripple them. The suit also boasted... So it's an Andromedon suit for humans, is what you're saying. The suit also boasted one of the most advanced computers we had access to at the time, one that could learn and adapt to changing conditions in the battlefield, and provide advice for soldiers. Trojan was meant to be cutting edge, the answer to the alien menace, and a new age of warfare protection. At least it was, until XCOM fell, and with XCOM gone, the project was abandoned. Save for a single functioning suit, no trace of the project was left, and it was lost when the research base that it was built in was leveled. When XCOM was reformed and the old files were dusted off, the Trojan program was briefly considered, but without the suit to work with, it was deemed too costly and was dropped. Ooh, excuse me. That is until reports of Advent supply depots began attacking. Uh, that is until reports of Advent supply depots being attacked featured on ar featured an armor-clad individual that suggested the suit may still be functioning. At first, it was thought of nothing more than a coincidence. Someone luckily found the base ruins, or was some XCOM survivor that wanted to use it, use in a failed project. 
one of these command consoles, there's gonna be hell to pay. It, it's Tigan. It's uh, totally Tigan. But when multiple reports claimed that this figure had been grievously injured only to reappear a short time later, Bradford began to wonder if the project had succeeded. Instructing Shin to build the recall beacon that would call the suit back to base, Bradford was surprised to see it standing at the Avengers' door a few days later. Singed, battered, but standing. He was less happy to find it talking in a pre-generated voice and that it was sealed tight. Okay. So it turns out the suit was being tested when the base fell. And while the pilot passed on, the suit... Oh, does that mean there's someone dead for 20 years inside? Uh, and while the pilot passed on, the suit and the imprint they left stayed active. However, as time passed, programming became corrupted and machinery wore out. Eventually, the imprint began fading, leaving something neither human nor AI behind. Now with the XCOM reformed, Trojan found itself set on a single path, joining up and finding aliens. Now with Trojan received, as Trojan received repairs, it began to experience old memories and uncover data files from when it was first turned on, leading the suit down a winding path of discovering more about the person that made the current Trojan. Oh. Bradford notes, Gonna be honest, not sure what to think of this one. Even by today's standards, Trojan is advanced, even if half the armor has been replaced by now. Still, I'm about weird. Uh, still a beer. <laughs> still, I'm a bit weirded out by an empty suit of armor being alive. Call me old-fashioned, but there see there are some things I struggle to wrap my head around. Shen seems to be over the moon with it, though. Oh, Miriam might be too. Yeah. Anaconda. Uh, Anna Slither Conda. Country of origin unknown, holds a Panamanian passport. Date of birth unknown, supposedly born around 1985. Zio Bradford's profile. Let's not beat around the bush. This lady is a former terrorist. She's done everything from assassinations to bombings, from arms dealing to espionage. Just because she doesn't look capable of doing it doesn't mean she didn't do it. She's a real piece of work. Once the aliens came, the organization she was a part of crumbled. A few pockets of activity resurfaced years, surfaced, resurfaced years later, turning in saboteurs, assassins, and spies working for their resistance whenever needed. A pretty face like this lady could easily blend into and, and added it. a pretty face like this lady's could easily blend into an advent city, carry on a mission, and disappear as suddenly as she appeared. Nobody really cares what she had done before. All I care right now is to put her skills to good use. Her record is probably long buried somewhere by now anyway. It's not vanished completely. I promise that she can go wherever she wants after this is done. We gotta admit her name is kind of fitting. Slippery like a snake. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? And finally, I believe, Francesca Kill Count Tobin, at least finally in, in this episode. Not much is known about the former inmate, but Francesca Tobin will tell you that not all those who fight against the invaders are noble people who do so for helpless reasons. Sometimes they are just former monsters who hate that a bigger monster came around and stole their thunder. What is known is that Francesca was imprisoned in a high security prison for multiple homicides and was on the list of being executed. Looking for her, the invaders came before her date and caused enough issues with the local resistance group and caused enough issues that the local resistance groups would take anyone that could wield a weapon. Looking for us, she decided that Avent and the elders were too much of a real threat that someone like her wasn't as scary. She's all too eager to remind people that not everyone is a hero and show the elders exactly what the darkest part of humanity truly is. A deal with a devil to destroy a demon, I suppose. All right. I think that is everyone. Doesn't look like we missed anyone. Again, I'll need to, I'll try to remember to read Zong and Martinez um, once they are back. But uh, this is a little short episode, I guess, to read bios. Like I said, basically an episode 1B. 
Um, the other episode, I was kind of planning on doing this anyway, but the other episode ended up being longer than I was anticipating anyway. So this will keep it from being like, <laughs> from it being like two hours long. But uh, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you here next time on XCOM 2 War of the Chosen.